this idea of food as medicine, it's all seen as fluffy. It's just astounding to me that as kids are being basically force fed ultra processed food, incentivized for a sedentary lifestyle in schools, you know, that we've convinced people that the only serious response to that is, is drugging them. <laughs> And this medical system where every single lever, you know, the med schools, the pharma companies, the hospitals, the insurance companies, they are silent because they have washed their hands of why people are getting sick and make money on basically cleaning up the mess and managing the mess, not curing it. Kali Means is a graduate of Stanford and Harvard Business School. Early in his career, he was a consultant for food and pharmaceutical companies and is now exposing the practices that they use to weaponize our institutions of trust. Kali Means, number one book in America right now. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. So Thank good you, to sir. see you. So good to see you. Looking to do a deep dive today. And I wanna start off talking about our current healthcare model. In particular, it is largely centered around pharmacology. Right. And let's just talk about some facts because I don't think a lot of people realize how things are actually working right now. So the big question is, is it working? Well, it's obviously not working. I mean, we were just talking before the show started about kids. And, you know, I've talked about this. I'm from the right side of the aisle. I believe in personal responsibility. That's what I started my career in and, and really preaching those concepts. It's not personal responsibility and free choice that 50% of teens are overweight or obese. <laughs> it's not personal responsibility and personal choice that 25% of teens have fatty liver disease. It's not personal choice that obesity is skyrocketing now among six-year-olds, that kids are now being born in utero with metabolic dysfunction, that 40% of high schoolers qualify as having a mental health disorder. There is something, all you have to do is look at kids, because I think this gets conflated a lot. It's like, oh, Americans are lazy. Oh, Americans are making the wrong decisions. Parents aren't trying to poison their kids. And I don't think kids are choosing to be metabolic dysfunctional, uh, overweight, sick, depressed. And, and this is all happening at truly a, a epidemic level. So all you have to do to understand whether our siloed healthcare system is working is looking at kids. And yeah, as the book unpacks, I think you can really trace the incentives and understand why really specifically, not conspiratorially, but just really specifically looking at the economic incentives, why this is happening. Yeah, yeah. And obviously our treatments for these conditions that have skyrocketed right. in recent years are not yielding good results as well. Yeah, the book starts, chapter one, starts about Casey, uh, my sister, at the end of med school, and she's choosing her specialty. So all you have to know is that at the end of graduation, right, as, as doctors go out in the world for med school, they devote their lives to one of 42 specialties. We've divided the body, we've divided diseases into these siloed dozens of conditions. And then if you're really good, you further go deeper. <laughs> you actually go into a deeper part of one of those 42 specialties. So Casey chose the head and neck, head and neck surgery. So she was focused on a couple of square inches of the face. And she her dream was to do a fellowship and go even deeper. So the dean of Stanford Med School, Lloyd Minor, uh, was a head and neck surgeon. And he actually focused on like like one square inch of the face. <laughs> and he has the condition named, you know, minor syndrome after him. That's like a very technical small thing in the face. That's how you become Dean of Stanford Med School. So let's back up, right? What does this siloed system mean? Why, why are we incentivized to the siloed system? Does this make sense? I think we just take the siloing of medicine as a given, right? That you go and there's the cardiology department, there's the neurosurgery department, there's the, you know, dermatology for skin issues, there's the psychiatry that just like isn't questioned by anybody. This is the result of an absolutely broken system. What Casey learned by leaving the medical system, but wasn't trained in the medical system, was that diseases are often connected. But that is an absolutely disruptive and opposed message. Casey was doing surgery after surgery, cutting open people's inflammation in the face. And she was on her third surgery of the day. She's done hundreds, you know, over the previous years. And she never thought to ask why so many people had inflammation. And she started looking at people's charts and looking at every single person she was uh, cutting open on their sinus inflammation had diabetes. Almost certainly they had depression, definitely on stands for high cholesterol, all these comorbidities. And they were seeing different doctors that she had never met. 
So on average, a patient was on seven different medications and seeing seven different doctors for seven different treatment plans, not talking to them. So that's the average American patient's journey. And we kind of just upset, accept this siloing. And what Casey did and what I helped and what Casey helped me unpack, you know, being a consultant and a lobbyist for food and pharma early in my career, is that it's very clear why this siloing has happened. Because keeping patients in the dark, keeping them out of awe and curiosity for the interconnectivity, we never think, well, is depression related to our GI dysfunction? Is the diabetes related to our inevitable heart issues? That, that's not even brought up. But that's a profitable lie that these diseases are siloed because the greatest, most profitable uh, innovation in the history of American capitalism is metabolic dysfunction. It's the fuel of our largest industry, healthcare. And the simple economic reality is that almost every single dollar in our largest and fastest growing industry that employs the most people of any industry in the United States makes money on interventions when people are sick. And when you see heart disease as a statin deficiency and see sinus inflammation as something you can just cut out instead of cure the root cause and see prediabetes as a metformin deficiency and see depression as an SSRI deficiency, now see obesity as a zipid deficiency, you're not curing anything. These are all lifetime treatments. Everybody that Casey did surgery on on the sinusitis, almost almost to a person, would come back under the knife years later. The, the, the issue wasn't cured. And that just produces recurring expenses, that incur, recurring payments. And people just keep racking up the comorbidities, unpacking this system, and, and, and then this is what the book is arguing, and I, and I think it's resonating with people. This isn't an incremental change to healthcare policy. This isn't about just you know the importance of healthy eating or walking and things like that, which are which are vital. It's about incentivizing those actions with our healthcare system. It's about the standard of care in medicine. It's about the complete and utter corruption that a child who is dealing who's a little sad is going to be thrown an SSRI right away instead of talking about um, going out in the sun or exercising, which are much more effective, just scientifically much more effective modalities. And on the first day of Stanford Med School, Casey was trained. She said the Ameri they were, she was told the American patients are lazy. She said, there's nothing we can do to help uh, them eat healthy. They want to not sleep well. They want to you know, have chronic stress. I don't think that's true. I think if the medical system followed the simple habits that we talk about in this book that you talk about every day and actually incentivized those things and recommended those things, um, I think we'd have a totally different country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even that overarching belief that's instilled in healthcare practitioners that the patient is lazy, lazy, that they don't listen. These are all things that I picked up in my university education as well. Even that has been disproven. And in fact, there was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the early 2000s. And, and this is another loophole with right. pharmacology is when we're putting things through the highest form of randomized controlled trials, you know, double blind, placebo control, all this stuff, we're putting the drug usually against nothing. Right. The drug is going up against nothing. Not, not a previously used and confirmed effective drug, not a lifestyle intervention, not a supplement, not exercise, it goes against nothing. Right. But this particular study, they took over 3,000 pre-diabetics and split them into three groups. One group was given general health information and put on metformin. Mm. One group was given general health information and put on a placebo. Mm. Another group was given intensive lifestyle modification, exercise, diet, behavior change, and support. Mm. And contrary to the dogma that People won't listen and apply. These people did for three years, for three years. And they gathered all the data at the end of the study. Not only did those folks who received the intensive lifestyle modification have a significantly higher weight loss, about 12 pounds on average. Wow. These folks had, and this is compared to the placebo group, 58% reduction in their development and their risk of developing diabetes, 58% versus the metformin group, 39%. Wow. All right, so we're talking about 20% greater benefit from changing lifestyle. And they adhered to it, contrary to popular beliefs. What I'm trying to say is yeah, it works better and people will do it if they're taught. I might be new to this fight and too optimistic, but I really feel like we are at a turning point in the country. When you look at what 
politicians are talking about, when you look at what books are selling, when you look at podcasts, um, there's a fundamental rallying cry of this book and a fundamental assumption is that Americans want to be healthy. Um, my mom, we've talked about on previous podcasts, abruptly died of cancer. And, you know, she was thrown the stat and the metformin, the ACE inhibitor, you know, over the 30 years. And I can tell you, she wanted to live <laughs> and she wanted to meet her grandson, um, which she wasn't able to do. Um, and dads want to walk their daughters down the aisle and Americans want to thrive. I mean, it's just that simple. I, I would just challenge if anyone listening right now or, or people in listeners' lives that they know many people that want to be sick. <laughs> I just think this is an absolute lie. And the, another key theme of this book is this is relatively simple to change. And it can happen so quickly. I think we missed a absolutely historical generational moment during COVID. When we're, we were dying in, as Americans, multiple times higher mortality rates from COVID than other countries because our immune systems are so weak. You can change your metabolic health, your indicators, your HDL, your triglycerides, your waist size, your um, blood sugar. You can change these things like in months. I actually, when Casey got me into shape a couple years ago, as I started getting on this journey, I, I, I tested my levels every quarter and you can, you can dramatic, and I, 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 I'm not a model, I think. I, I just started doing some simple habits, <laughs> simple habits we all know about. We could have had the country rallied yeah. by the medical leaders in 2020 um, to get uh, a little bit uh, hardened up on, on our metabolic health and it would have transformed. To your point, not just if you're doing that study for diabetes and the metformin, you know, probably, uh, you know, addressed a couple indicators, you're absolutely plummeting your risk of other comorbidities in exactly. overall lifetime. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a key point. This book, and I think there is a revolution happening in the bottoms up, um, but, but, but our advice for patients is, you know, how, how they kind of understand the paradigm. With, when you're dealing with the medical system, you really should take more empowerment when it comes to chronic conditions, which is the majority of what's ailing us, the majority of deaths, the majority of costs. Chronic conditions, the American patient can stand to think a little bit more for themselves on that. If you have a, you know, burst appendix or a complicated childbirth or an infection, absolutely, an acute issue that's going to kill you, go 100%. We have a miracle medical system. But almost everything is around chronic conditions right now. And the bottoms up revolution is going to happen from people, frankly, listening less to the medical system, more to their own intuition, more understand their own habits when it comes to metabolic health. But something I'm very passionate about, I just love being on the team with Casey's. Casey's, I think, the best science communicator on these concepts. And this is a book of bottoms up empowerment. But we've got to change the top down too. Um, yeah. We're really... Uh, hanging out to dry with the trillions of dollars of incentives of our healthcare system that are incentivized to us to be sick. So I think what's happening is the bottoms up revolution, people listening to this podcast, people really taking matters in their own hands, talking about it, changing their lives, realizing that they you know, can, can go outside the medical system on chronic conditions is impacting culture. And what we've got to do is literally just change the standard of care. It's changing the standard of care. What is somebody recommended? What do we incentivize when somebody has diabetes? What does somebody get recommended when they have slightly high cholesterol and are about to get that stand? What is somebody recommended uh, to do when they are suffering from depression, which is almost anyone at some uh, in some point in their lives? Um, and I just say, follow the science. It's not an anti-drug message, but as far as being easy to change, I, I, I want to say this, we're, we're exporting our uh, diet in many ways throughout the world, but we are like an order of magnitude worse than the United States. I mean, when you're in Japan or many countries in Europe and have prediabetes or diabetes, you get a government subsidized, healthcare subsidized keto diet. Um, they actually pay lower income folks to exercise. They pay as part of the medical spending when you have a metabolic condition. Um, these policies exist and they're no brainer. And the differences between these countries and the U.S. is astounding. It, it, the obesity rate in Japan is like 4%, right? Among kids, it's like close to zero. It's over 20% childhood uh, obesity in the U.S. and 50%, as I mentioned, of teens are overweight or obese. That is a moral stain on the country. And it is, it is order of magnitudes lower in other countries. So, so this isn't hard. Uh, this just takes courage. That's real world proof right now on planet earth of what works, right? 
And, you know, with that, they also have significantly lower rates of pretty much every chronic disease you can name and also longer life expectancy, which you would expect, right? And so these are things that are possible. But we've got to talk about how how we got here. And this mm-hmm. is very important because, and by the way, we've mentioned Casey many times, Dr. Casey Means, co-author of Good Energy, number one, <laughs> number one book in America. So, so happy for you guys. So proud of you guys. It's amazing. And so within her education, Stanford trained physician, she shared some other insights as well that you're well aware of, again, working alongside, you were working with the ops, all right? So you worked with pharma, you work with big food. Right. And so the question is why are very intelligent, well-meaning physicians looking at depression as an SSRI deficiency? Why are they looking at diabetes or pre-diabetes as a metformin deficiency. How did all of that happen? Why is it pharma first? The brilliance of the institutional design of our healthcare system is it takes some of the most smart, dedicated people in the world, feeds them into it, saddles them with societal expectation, saddles them with a lot of debt, saddles them with, in their minds, an inability to do anything else, and then throws them into this system where almost everyone eventually realizes the patients aren't getting better. And I think Casey, and I hope what she inspires other people in the medical field to do is, is she had the courage to leave. And I'm, you know, as I said, I'm a traditional, kind of we raised in a traditional conservative family. And I thought that success was rising up the ranks of our, you know, elite institutions. And I thought she was so dumb to leave medicine. I was like, what are you doing? You've, you've paid all the dues. You know, you're, you're getting all the plaudits. You're winning awards, Stanford med school, had a neck surgery. Like this is so dumb. And she didn't have a plan. She's just like, I know it's wrong. And she somehow had that courage in her body to really, in my mind at the time, throw away her entire life of training. And I think most people don't have the moral fortitude or or whatever it is to do that. And and I think most people actually in the system do know something very, very wrong is happening. But the genius of the institutional design, and you can really study government or uh, institutional design of other systems that have produced really bad outcomes, their their inputs are good people. (laughs) And the problem is, it's just this simple economic incentive. And I just can't stress this enough. And let's get away from conspiracies, away from any conjecture. The largest industry in the country that is so complicated, not any one person can understand it, um, is just fundamentally incentivized for more sick patients to grow. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a lead obesity doctor at Harvard recently. And she said she would cure childhood obesity if she could snap her fingers. But there has to be more patients in order for her to employ people. There has to be more obese kids and more obese patients and more people on the rolls to justify the assumptions that they made to build their clinic and hire people. And she feels that push every day. Um, As a surgeon at Stanford, Casey saw her friends crying in the hallways for doing surgeries that they knew weren't necessary for being pushed to do those. Um, They know what they were doing isn't right, but they have plausible deniability. They're at Stanford. They're being told by their superiors that this is what to do. And their fundamental economic incentive is to do more procedures. It's it's called eat what you kill. That's a very common phrase used among medical professionals. They have to do more surgeries and more interventions. Um, One of the head oncologists, when Casey was uh, at Stanford, said uh, offhandedly that if you're coming into my clinic, you're getting cut open. That, of course, informed... Uh, my sister's guidance to my mom as those same oncologists at Stanford when she had stage four pancreatic cancer were pushing interventions on her. Casey said, we're going to leave. We're, we're going to die peacefully at home and not do these unnecessary interventions. 99.9% of pa- uh, patients wouldn't have had that guidance. But these are the economic incentives um, that are, are are fueling it. Two more quick things. They're really, this really can be traced. Um, the medical system exists today under the Flexner Report, um, a report written in 1909. And it was written by a lawyer. Flexner was a lawyer for John D. Rockefeller. Uh, John D. Rockefeller paid this guy 
he lobbied to get him in front of Congress, and this lawyer wrote the report for modern medicine. And it said, disease has to be siloed, and we have an evidence-based situation where we silo disease and have a specific recommendation, a specific pharmaceutical treatment, a specific intervention for that specific named condition. This was not intuitive. The economic rationale behind that is that John D. Rockefeller was the father of the modern pharmaceutical industry from byproducts of oil exploration, and he was the chief funder and propagator of modern medical schools. He was a lead donor to Johns Hopkins and other East Coast medical schools that he wanted to basically propagate and solidify you know, this serious medicine with surgeons and, and, and the kind of medicine we know today, he denigrated any type of nutrition. He denigrated any type of holistic thinking. He denigrated every other medical uh, modality. Now, that has cemented this idea, and we talk about in the book, this Halsteadian idea that the lead uh, surgeon at Johns Hopkins at the time who created modern medical residency, who propagated this idea aggressively into the law that modern medicine and serious medicine is cutting someone open, is producing a procedure. Um, that guy actually ended up uh, being a cocaine addict, having horrible manic depressive episodes, actually instilled this idea of residency where people kind of work around the clock and driving people that still exists to this day. People didn't understand. He actually, after doing you know four day rounds of surgery and kind of breeding this very macho idea that still exists to this day in, in medical education, he had horrible breakdowns and had to go to the hospital for psychiatric treatment for Gotta six months. And he coke. went back and forth. Got yeah. some coke to get so, through. So, 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 so actually, because of the incentives, direct incentives from John D. Rockefeller to have this intervention-based system, to have this silo disease-based system, it was enshrined in the laws. It was enshrined into the foundation of medical education that exists this day. And then as Casey started unpacking this, right, these industries have propagated that. More than 50% of Stanford Medical School's funding somehow touches pharma. Pharma is the largest funder of medical research. They're the largest funder of med schools. They're the largest funder of regulatory agencies. The FDA receives... 75% of their funding from pharma. It's not taxpayers. It literally is funded by pharmaceuticals. And you say, okay, well, it's, an, it's a regulatory agency. They don't have really incentives to grow. I, I can tell you from being in DC, bureaucracies have an incentive to grow. <laughs> That's just what bureaucracies do. And they grow by pharma growing. Um, so yeah, this was put very intentionally into place. And you know those incentives by Rockefeller directly traced to Casey being told by her attending surgeon when Casey recommended dietary interventions to somebody who had chronic migraines, and obviously that's tied to diet. The doctor told her to uh, go to nutrition school if she wanted to practice and give diet advice, that this is serious medicine, that we prescribe pills and cut people open and never give patient a patient uh, dietary advice again. That was what she was told. Oh my God. Yeah. We're, we're serious medicine. Serious medicine is the scalpel and the prescription pad. That is a convenient idea, right? It's so marginalized, um, this idea of, uh, of nutrition, <laughs> of what we eat. It's like serious if you compounded some element into a synthetic pill. But the idea that the omega-3s in salmon, actually, if you eat 1,000 milligrams, is more impactful in reducing depression than an antidepressant pill. There, there's, those are real compounds in those food. Those are the compounds we're synthesizing to put in pills. I, the, the, this idea of food as medicine or exercise, it's all seen as fluffy. It's all seen as, it's very marginalized. Um, it's, just, it's just astounding to me, right? That as kids are being basically force-fed ultra-processed food, incentivized for a sedentary lifestyle in schools, stuck inside, no sunlight, sitting at desks, you know, that we've convinced people that the only serious response to that is, is drugging them. <laughs> we are poisoning kids and then we are drugging them. And this medical system where every single lever, you know, the med schools, the pharma companies, the hospitals, the insurance companies, they are silent because they have washed their hands of why people are getting sick and make money on basically cleaning up the mess and managing the mess, not curing it. Um, it is just the economic incentives. Yeah. And to, you know, to, to loop back to your question, 
we, we, I think it's hard for people to wrap their heads around this because it, it does sound so evil. This is kind of this question keeps coming up. But don't look at what people say. Don't even look at what they're thinking individually. Look at what a system does. Look at what it's designed to do. The invisible hand of economic incentives creates the outcomes that those incentives propagate. And I just, the key message of this book is that knowledge is, is, is power and you can do so much better. And there's such a path forward of trusting yourself a little bit more. I love that. Yeah. What you guys are really illuminating with this book mm -hmm. and with your mission is that we don't have a system currently. We based primarily, and just, it's a logical thing. It's a very lucrative system. And it is a multi-trillion dollar system that is dependent on having a lot of sick people. Mm -hmm. And we're not looking at character. We're not looking at fault. We're just looking at a system that is and exists. And we've devolved or evolved, however you want to look at it, into a system to where pharmaceutical companies, multi, multi-billion dollar drug companies are funding the education that our practitioners are getting. And so again, when we have a patient that's coming in that might have marginally high blood sugar and looking at metformin as a solution, that is what is taught as a solution. And you said something earlier that was so remarkable that, you know, going back to the Flexner report, mm -hmm. right? And, and being able to create a specific label for things. So we have this specific label of diabetes. Now we have a specific drug or a specific surgery that might come about if it's a different condition, for example, but it creates standard of care. Right. But the problem is there is no human being that is truly standard. Right. We're all different. There is no two cases of diabetes that are the same, no two cases of Alzheimer's, no two cases of depression. Exactly. And that's really where we began to fail is to stop treating the person. And as you mentioned, not only not treating the person, but breaking you into all these parts right. as well and not having communication within all the different people who are now treating your different parts. And one of the really standout things that I've learned from you guys recently, or just really illuminating, shining a brighter light on it for me, yeah. is our system is now created in a way or existing in a way that treating these chronic conditions, right? You being on a statin, mm -hmm. you being on metformin, you being on an SSRI, you being on an anti-anxiety medication, being on something for arthritis pain, you can, you can stay alive, right? We can keep functioning by treating the symptoms of these conditions, not getting rid of the root cause, right? right? You become a walking, talking cash cow for them oh, until we have a major breakdown right? Until we have the big C word hit, until we have the big, you know, heart attack happen. And then you've got a whole other course of lucrative things to be done. Why on earth would we just wave a wand and eliminate all this lucrative business? That's the question. The reason chronic disease is such a powerful profit maximizing engine is because people get sick, they rack up comorbidities, but they don't die. They just suffer. They live a suboptimal life. And that's what's really tragic in America. We're not at our best. You know, inevitably, if you have prediabetes, which 33% of young adults have right now, you are almost signing up for depression, you know, multiples more uh, uh, chances of depression or suicide because diabetes is metabolic dysfunction. If you're diabetic by the time you're 30, you're dying at least 10 years earlier on average. Um, you know, you, you're just representing a ton of other comorbidities. 99% of people with diabetes, you know, have at least one other comorbidities. The vast majority have, you know, more than three. So you're, you're basically, by bringing the curve down, we don't call it early onset diabetes anymore because so many kids are getting it. You know, by bringing the curve of metabolic dysfunction earlier and earlier into life, you're just signing people up for this treadmill of suffering, but they don't die yet. It's reaching almost an unsustainable point as you've alluded to, because the difference in life expectancy between the US and other countries, it isn't marginal. It's seven years between us and Japan. I mean, that's a lot <laughs> um, when you look at the percent. I mean, that that's, so we're talking like in the US, I think it's 77 years and it's like, it's seven years more. 
Um, this isn't a marginal thing. And then life expectancy is actually declining in the US well before COVID in a sustained way, um, really an unprecedented way. So it's catching up with us. But yeah, uh, that is the problem with chronic disease for patients. And the good thing, just economically for the system, people keep racking them up. And it's so sad, right? Because as you said, and patients want to be healthy. Um, and I really think that if parents and those kids are told when they exhibit the first sign of high cholesterol or slight obesity or the high blood sugar, if they were told you're signing up for a life that's 10 years short on average, that is going to almost certainly have mental health challenges, that's going to have other comorbidities, if they're explained that and then given the intensive training and hopefully even incentives to go a different path, that's transforming that kid's life. And I think they want to do it. I think the parents want to do that. We listen to medical leaders. You know, when the medical leaders in the 80s, way too late, said stop smoking, we stopped smoking for the large part. When they said in the 90s with the food pyramid, terrible advice to eat more carbs, we did that. 20% up uh, in the next 10 years of the American diet went to carbs, a 20% increase. We listen to, but medical leaders right now are saying, the USDA is saying and diet 91% in ultra processed food for kids is healthy. We just had a report on that. You know, they're saying that the standard of care now for a 12 year old who's slightly overweight should be a lifetime injection with Ozempic. That, that's the guidance. The guidance is if, the, the guidance of the American Heart Association is that every adult American should be on a statin, regardless of their blood uh, blood testing. So it, it, it's, a, it's a question of incentives. Let's talk about what we can do about this. And really, you, you said something really powerful. And I talked about this years ago when I was working on Eat Smarter, top down and bottom up change. Yeah. And being very practical about it because I've existed in these different universes and, you know, living in poverty in the United States and being able to still find a way because mm -hmm. there's this, there's a sentiment that we have of the food desert, for example. And if I definitely lived in a glorified food desert or what's sure. labeled as a food desert, living in Ferguson, Missouri, when I had my worst health and when I transformed my health that is led in that in that environment eventually led to me impacting the lives of millions of people for the better living in that environment now with that being said we've got to even change I think if we even change the moniker of it being a food desert would be helpful because that takes away opportunity I'm in a desert right I'm just out here with a camel you know and just, just trying to find some water. I'm seeing mirages, mm -hmm. but that's, it's not really like that. It's more like a food swamp. All right. Because we're kind of drudging through conditions to where I'm inundated with both. I'm inundated with poor quality, ultra processed food, but there's also healthy food there. I just don't know the difference. I don't know that it exists and it was there the whole time. Yeah. And so with that being said, and before we really dig into food, I want to close this loop with big pharma and what, what can be done with some policy change because the education system is being deeply impacted, but also us as consumers. And one of your recommendations, or even again, just policy change that you could, we can have this happen, is the advertisements directly to us by drug companies. Let's talk about policy change on that. Well, we're the only country in the world, New Zealand does a little bit, but but we really predominantly are the only country where pharma is able to completely buy off our information sources. So 60% of TV news spending comes from the pharmaceutical industry. And the key point there is that impacts our psychology that, you know, there's a basically a miracle cure for every single condition, which is a lie. There's never been a chronic disease medication in the history of America that's lowered rates of that chronic disease. If you think about it, literally with Ozempic, the stock analysis from JP Morgan that underlies the insane valuation of that company assumes that obesity is going to go up as more Ozempic's prescribed. So you'll have to unpack that one for me. Um, and of course, you look at statins, metformin, SSRIs, Adderall. You know, is ADHD going down as more Adderall prescriptions are being doled out? No. So, 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 so that's just. Um, fundamental Th that it creates that with the advertising but it's 60 percent of tv news ads and the key point there is it impacts consumers yes but allows the industry to buy off the news itself so our information sources fundamentally you know you don't see on major news channels um inquiring why 33 percent of young adults have prediabetes 
the COVID, which was a, really a metabolic condition. I call COVID a foodborne illness because if you were metabolically healthy, you weren't dying of COVID almost certainly. Uh, no, it was it was all airtime on a pharmaceutical solution. Um, the, fundamentally, the media isn't asking questions about what's obviously the biggest issue in the country, which is that we're getting sicker, more depressed, more infertile while going bankrupt, <laughs> trying to treat the problem. And it's going to basically be an existential risk through our country. Um, whereas on independent media and books uh, that people are flocking to are really about metabolic health. I mean, from Joe Rogan on down, Joe Rogan is a metabolic health podcast. They're talking about these things every day. This is what people just flock to. People are concerned about their health and their kids' health, which clearly isn't going right. I mean, even with this book, um, it's been propelled by independent media, but you know, nothing, nothing on mainstream media. Um, and uh, we've actually heard from producers there that they don't have anything that has critical pharma. That's just the blanket rule. Uh, and crazy. that is what it is. Yeah. And that's because it's very simple. And I don't even blame them. When your bills are paid 60% by an industry, you're not going to go against them. Tomorrow, the president could sign an executive order outlawing that. Tomorrow. It was actually integrated with an executive order from Reagan. Uh, it was changed and, and allowed direct to farm rights. This could be changed tomorrow. And it would have a profound impact on our um, information sources and kind of national debate. The second thing I'll just mention real quick is you, I, I get angry when I think about this, this concept of the food deserts, quite frankly, uh, that uh, we have an ability to change that t tomorrow. Uh, food deserts are a result of our SNAP program. And the fact that we are the only country in the world that lets our low income nutrition program go to uh, soda, it's the number one item, 10%, and 70% of that entire program goes to ultra processed food. Um, I'm actually working with a coalition to advocate for SNAP reform, and it is just painful to me, and it should enrage every American, that we have $120 billion of taxpayer money going to kids where you know lower-income moms are trying to support their kids and depending on this program for nutrition, and that's shoving addictive, toxic crap into kids' mouths. Um, it is public policy insanity. Uh, I, don't th I don't think these products should be banned necessarily. I mean, there's some really problematic ingredients, but we shouldn't be subsidizing them. We should be setting, you know, everyone, if we're spending the money on 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 healthy food that creates a thriving population. Yeah. And the, 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 the day that changes, the day SNAP changes, um, you know, to incentivize non-toxic food, the next day that food would be more available in those food deserts. So um, that's another thing that can be changed very quickly. It can be changed with an executive order that we're gonna clean up the SNAP program, potentially even add more money to it. It's the best investment we can make as a country. This is not partisan at all. We are now poisoning our lower income population and then Medicaid is now a bigger line item in the entire defense budget, even on just metabolic conditions. We're spending much more as a government on metabolic dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction than all defense, um, than, than any other line item. It's the largest line item if you add up mitochondrial and metabolic dysfunction diseases in our medical budget, it's the largest item in the US government budget. So um, yeah, you could clean up the SNAP incentives, clean up the agricultural subsidy incentives. The other thing I'm working with across the aisle, and I hope uh, the president or, or, or the next president signs, is just getting to the science on the recommendations. Uh, the step one is that we follow the science on what the FDA is telling us and what the USDA is telling us on nutrition. I just can't, emphasize this enough, the criminality of the USDA recommending added sugar to two-year-olds. It is just unfathomable. Like when you talk about this kind of suicidal impulses and like Americans not wanting to be healthy and like what's going on, we're following recommendations. Like kids being like served sugar and then getting obese and having a diabetes and fatty liver disease crisis, it's because parents are literally following the guidelines. Uh, forget the policy. The USDA should declare immediately a metabolic health crisis among children that is threatening to destroy the human capital of our country and advise that sugar, added sugar, is not recommended for infants. <laughs> like, like, let the policy fall where it may, but the medical guidance, but we co opt industries I used to work for, co opt this and literally. They have stakeholders come in. They literally tell that USDA, well, you can't recommend against sugar because lower income people, because of the rigged incentives, can only afford food that has toxic ingredients. 
the USDA should not be worried about any other outside factors than the science. And then you can compel them to do that with some executive orders. Yeah. So our group, we have, we have a group actually of, um, you know, what I'm trying to do, Sean, is just use the tactics uh, that pharma and the food industry have used against us. Um, that's how we win. Um, I think the key is that this issue obviously is resonating with with your listeners. There, it's resonating across the country. Nobody wants this metabolic disease epidemic among kids. But what the food companies do and the pharma companies do is they're able to target specific issues. That the second there's a bill on changing the USDA guidelines, the lobbyists are in the office. They're donating. They're pounding. They're pounding the media. That the second there's you know an issue of taking food colorings out of cereal, this is actually happening right now. The lobbyists, lobbyists, lobbyists. No, no parent wants toxic food colorings that are tied to ADHD and cereal. Um, you know, if you poll people, ninety five percent of people don't want that, but they lobby. So we have uh, are actually launching a nonprofit with CEOs of leading health and wellness companies from CrossFit to Thrive Market to Athletic Greens, and we are going to channel our voices. We're going to share stories about how these health and wellness products actually help change people's lives getting off of pharmaceuticals. And we're going to lobby on specific bills. We're also going to avail ourselves of the legal system. I'm working with an activist investor, the founder of Who Chocolates, Jason Karp, Vani Hari, Food Babe on Instagram. We're actually uh, launched an activist action against Kellogg's and are engaging with the CEO about the food coloring. Uh, he actually said recently that... Um, Americans, now that we're dealing with so much inflation, should be encouraged to have Fruit Loops for dinner. And Fruit Loops are reformulated in the United States with artificial dyes that they don't put in their ingredients for any other country. They literally reformulate them for the US children with more poison and then encourage them for dinner. It's completely wrong. We've launched some action against them and they're actually at the table um, uh, with that. So um, so you've got to focus on specifics. You've got to write the executive orders. You've got to write the bills. You know, people say, why are you focused on Kellogg's? The problem is much larger. No, no, we're going to focus on Kellogg's. We're going to focus on that problem. We're going to focus on Fruit Loops getting those colorings out and the, 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 the reformulation to poison American kids more. And then we're going to go to the next company and the next company. We're going to focus on an executive order on pharmaceutical ads on TV going to get that done and go to the next thing. They want us to be talking broad. Yeah. And I think the broad talk is very important and understanding is very important. But we're the cavalry's coming on specific issues and Bill Ackman many billionaires uh, and, and people with a lot of means have actually supported these efforts on Twitter. You know, there, there's a coalition forming and 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 I think people want to do the right thing and that we're we're working to channel that. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. So very again, very practical and very easy when it boils down to it, yeah. a signature away from oh, yeah. getting pharma ads off of television. But the underlying piece of that isn't just the marketing to us, the fact that pharmaceutical companies really, they're not just buying ad time, they're buying the news. Mm -hmm. And that's where so many people are getting their information, right? And you're not going to get real health affirmative information on these platforms. I've been on the platforms. Yeah. I was just on Good Morning America. There's all these things I can't say, right? I can't say that this, I can't talk about this particular study that's, you know, proven this, this does this. That. No, no, no. A drug does that. I can't say these things. It's all very superficial. Ha ha. You know, that tastes good. Yeah. All this like horse and pony stuff. And that's why, of course, I had committed to not doing these things again. But I was like, okay, maybe this time will be different. Let me see if it's, no, it's not different. Mm -hmm. It's not different. And the, 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 the underpinning of even the the entity itself is about the propagation of fear. It's about the disempowerment of our citizens. You don't have power, you know, you need us. We're gonna keep you safe. We're gonna keep you informed. And reality couldn't be further from that. And so that's number one, removing these ads. And only recently I started watching some network TV again because my son is really into basketball. So I started watching right. uh, basketball again, the NBA. And I, I'm sitting because I'm different. You know, my my vision is different. I'm watching every commercial break without fail. Every break is ultra processed food, alcohol, and sprinkle in an occasional car. See where you can use your car to go drive and buy that shit if you want, but it'll get delivered to you. And then pharmaceutical ads are sprinkled in the mix. Not every commercial break, but but a lot of them, right? And so it's just like, and it's on repeat, repeat every single commercial break. And I'm just like, 
I cannot believe, and I'm tell, informing my son, I'm like, do you see this? Like, this is not normal. Like this is, this ad right here, this isn't even allowed in other countries besides us in New Zealand that you would see something like this. And even in New Zealand, there's more stringent laws on what they can say. They could just put up literally all this fantastical imagery. It can be you walking with Gandalf into the forest and shit and just be like, you know, you're gonna feel so much better, you know, with this particular, with Zoloff, you know? And then, of course, they whisper all the side effects and erectile dysfunction, anal bleeding and death and all this stuff. It's just like they just sprinkle it in there. And sometimes, again, that'll happen. And I'll point it out. I'll pause it like, wait a minute, guys, did you just hear? They just said death. Hold up. Let me ro roll it back. And I'm like, they have these outcomes and they're disclosing it because these things happens when, happen when the drugs are tested. They're not just saying this. They're trying to let you know, like, hey, you get all this benefit but you might die or you might have this particular thing happen. And this is the system we're existing in. So policy change for let's remove this stuff from our faces, from being able to fund the news itself. Let's, and I love this so much, end subsidies for poisonous food is another very practical and obvious policy change as well. And also let's address policy change in eliminating the conflicts of interest in Nutrition research, right. these are all very practical, top-down changes that can create a healthier environment for us to exist in. The last one I'll add, and this might get to actually connecting it to bottoms-up empowerment, is I don't think it's a buzzword to say that the American people want to be healthy. And I, I think as a high-level concept, enabling the American people choice with their healthcare spending is really important. Fundamentally, what we have is 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 the average American has a number of chronic conditions, and right now we have a one size fits all system that basically waits for them to get sick and then funnels them into a drug, which, as you mentioned, are often very ineffective. As Dr. Robert Lustig has pointed out, a statin, um, all the prescriptions you get for that increase life expectancy an average of four days. Um, the majority of folks who are prescribed an SSRI see no benefit. It's a it's a total one size fits all ineffective system. Um, so so that that's what people basically have no choice to do. I'm a huge proponent and started a company to to promote this uh, of HSAs. What's interesting about HSAs? So these are most people have these or an FSA. These tax free dollars. They're very confusing uh, for a lot of people. But they basically give you the choice on where to spend your healthcare dollars. Most people think they have to just get sick and it's to buy drugs. And they're like, oh, you know, a lot of people I talked about HSA, oh, I'm not sick yet. So I'm not buying a bunch of drugs. I don't need it. What we learned is that you can actually use that money to buy exercise, to buy red light therapy if you have inflammation, to buy an eight sleep if you have trouble sleeping. Uh, if you actually have a doctor write a note that ties a root cause intervention to the reversal prevention of a condition, which most of us have, you can actually steer those medical dollars to root cause modalities, uh, supplements too. Um, you know, vitamin D, omega-3 deficiencies, all these things are, are central to our chronic disease crisis. We, in the past four months, have steered $100 million. We've written 150,000 doctor's notes, 150,000 patients steering $100 million of tax-free money to exercise. Um, the CEO of CrossFit said this has been transformational for them. Um, Eight Sleep, Athletic Greens, a lot of these companies. That's where medical dollars can and actually should go. But very few patients, uh, when they see the high cholesterol numbers or see the high blood sugar numbers, is their doctor writing a letter of medical necessity, actually outlining specific science-backed exercise, sleep, diet protocols that they can actually use medical advantage tax-free dollars on. This is just a small example that we want to show efficacy on and promote for other programs. But imagine a world where Americans were actually able to be in control of where their medical dollars went and be asked the question, do you want to wait to get sick and then buy drugs to manage that? Or do you want to actually invest this $4.6 trillion we spent on healthcare into thriving. Um, I think that's obvious where patients would want to spend their money. So yeah. unlocking that choice, um, putting it on the patient. I have no interest in lecturing the American people, frankly, that much on diet, on exercise, on healthy habits. 
What I want is for patients to be informed. I want them to be informed on what the best science-backed standard of care actually is for the conditions that they have. They're not even told this. I'll just give one more example. Many friends, um, you know, I have right now, women are battling with PCOS. Infertility is skyrocketing among men as well, but PCOS is a scourge right now. I mean, it, it is popping up very often. Um, and those women are being shuttled on a path to invasive interventions, which are very important in many cases. And n not to comment on on that, and everyone's got to be on their own decision. And I don't care. I mean, a mom should absolutely make the decision they they want. But I don't think we're having informed consent at this point. PCOS is a metabolic condition. It's not tangentially a metabolic condition. PCOS is insulin resistance. It, it, that's literally what it is. So there's solutions for that. And this is clear in the data that uh, intensive keto diet and lifestyle interventions are the best uh, cure for PCOS ever studied. It, it actually can happen in a matter of months, uh, reversing the signs of PCOS. Um, it's highly related to chronic stress. It's highly related yeah. to what we're eating. And I'll tell you, um, I've yet to meet a woman who's at a traditional OBGYN who's ever been informed of that. I actually have friends uh, who are fertility specialists educated at places like Stanford and Harvard Med School that do not understand the link between PCOS and insulin resistance. They're not even, it's, it's literally not covered. So that is where we have to open up choice, open up informed consent, open up the ability for patients to steer their medical calls. Because 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 the, the the system right now will cover the estrogen pills. They'll cover the invasive procedures. It'll cover you know as you get slanted to that. But it it does nothing to incentivize or inform the patient about another road that. Additionally, would not even lower the PCOS, but actually address the warning sign of the PCOS, which is metabolic dysfunction, which if not addressed, will lead to other big problems yeah. for that woman. Yeah. Where can people get more information about HS HSAs? Yeah, we, our company is TrueMed.com, and we make it very easy. We literally looked at these sites that are prescribing Viagra and prescribing like Adderall very easily. We all know these sites. They're advertised <laughs> probably during the NBA games. We hired the same lawyers and we're like, how do we prescribe broccoli and CrossFit and omega-3s instead of, you know, <laughs> Adderall and Viagra? Um, so we designed a quick telehealth process to assess asynchronously in two minutes um, or what, however long it takes, but but an efficient telehealth survey like like the drug surveys um, of whether a lifestyle in intervention is warranted. And on our website, we've got these leading brands, Momentus, um, Eight Sleep, as I mentioned, um, Pendulum. We, we've partnered with leading companies and we're embedded into their payment flow. So you can actually assess your uh, eligibility for these items. We have third-party providers make those assessments and um, and pay seamlessly with HSA FSA dollars. Um, my message is wider than that. You know, for, for efficiently to do it and to learn more, go to truemed.com. But wider than that, uh, when your doctor is pulling out that prescription pad for you or your child, and again, for a chronic disease intervention, <laughs> if they have an infection, listen to your doctor. But if they're if you're on the borderline of the cholesterol or the blood sugar, they're starting to get you on that pharmaceutical treadmill. You should demand a letter of medical necessity for them first for lifestyle interventions. And if they don't know how to write that, get another doctor. You should frankly be demanding, as we go through in the book, a detailed um, analysis of how to read blood tests. You should be demanding a wider set of blood tests um, from that doctor to get a personalized understanding what's happening in your body. Um, but but that that that's truemed.com has more information, but I, I, I'm evangelical about this. Maximize your HSA or FSA, work with your medical provider or TrueMed to understand and you know work with them on a letter of medical necessity of core metabolic habits that are proven to prevent or reverse that condition. 
and then steer those medical dollars, those advantage dollars to your Peloton, to your gym membership, um, to your supplements. Uh, I think that's a really important part of the solution. Yeah. And that's the powerful part about good energy is we've got this multi faceted view of how do we actually fix these things. The education is phenomenal, yes, but also very practical solutions. Is there anything else pertinent? We've covered so much ground here. And again, we're we're really looking at the foundation, like how did this system get created? And also what are some science-backed and creative solutions? But is there anything else that you wanna share before I reluctantly let you go? It's that this is a story of optimism. We've been very negative about the medical system and the medical system has lost its way and the incentives has gone off track to a degree that will be existential if we don't reverse them. But we should all be optimistic. Um, we have produced miracles, particularly on acute conditions. On chronic disease management, a lot of these chronic diseases are byproducts of modern society, of things that have been good. I mean, as we talk about in the book, Light is so important. I've been shocked of how important light is. It, it literally sends signals to our cells. And it was just like 150 years ago or less that we invented artificial light. Mm -hmm. It used to just be, you know, this is a, actually a very disruptive uh, invention for our cells. Um, and we are still catching up with that. Exercise, we never used to have it. <laughs> the more we have gyms, the more gyms proliferate, the, 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 the more overweight and sicker we're getting because it just used to be built into our normal life. We had to walk. Um, temperature is the same thing. Convenient food. There never used to be pasture raised or all organic or all this stuff. Everything was. Um, movement. So, so, so all of these kind of stresses we're having on our metabolic health are, I think, byproducts of a lot of benefits of modern society. And I think we just have to look at it that way. We have to look at these taxes. We didn't used to have supplements. We just used to get the, the, the great things we needed from our food. Uh, but we are depleted in a lot of ways through our modern society. So that's a framework that's been helpful to me. Uh, you know, I don't love actually to, to exercise, but the second I thought of it as a tax, that we just have to pay <laughs> um, for the benefits of modern society, which I wouldn't want to go back on. So I do think there's an optimistic frame here. I think patients want to be healthy. I think that we have all these benefits of modern society have lost our way a little bit in how we think about how we need to fill them a little bit. Um, and if we can really, truly, radically change how we think about chronic conditions and think about the interconnectedness, which... Humbly, I'd suggest if you read this book, you, you will know as much or more than most doctors who are not trained about interconnectedness. You know, a foundational premise of this book is that when it comes to chronic disease, you can be your own guide. I know so many people listening are on that path, um, but we need to keep talking about it. Give this book to people if it resonates. Um, and, and the more we can just inspire our own personal bottoms up journeys on chronic disease reversal and understanding the interconnectivity of metabolic health we really will have a revolution in the in this country and, and we'll be thriving much more. And that path is available to us. Absolutely. The revolution will be televised and it will be podcasted. Kali Means, can you let everybody know where they can get their copy of Good Energy if they have not done so yet, which so many people have, number one book in America, where can people find it? Thank you, Sean. The, rev the revolution will be televised at least on amazing independent platforms like yours. And I'm so appreciative for you. And um, uh, the book's available everywhere. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Cali Means, my name, and uh, TrueMed.com is where we're we're pushing hard on the uh, HSA issue. Awesome, awesome. Good energy. Get your copy now. Kali, appreciate you so much. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. This was all the stuff that I used to recover from toxic mold and obesity and brain fog and chronic fatigue and all that, as well as stuff I used to upgrade myself. So I'm like, how, how do we make it available? And after eight years of testing all kinds of stuff and talking with thousands and thousands of members, these five buckets emerged.